Hello and welcome to a special episode of Connected by Controversy. I'm your host, Chris White. Today, I wanted to talk to someone who can provide us with some context surrounding the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, but maybe in a different way than what we've considered so far. Now, the issue in Ukraine is not limited to that country, of course. There's a broader international relations story at play here, and our guest today can shed some light on this. Dr. Michael Beckley is a leading expert on the the balance of power between the United States and China. He's the author of two books, and uh, actually more more than that, right? I think I've uh, seen there's two popular books, uh, but then you have some other ones out there we can get into. Um, And uh, multiple award-winning articles. He's an associate professor of political science at Tufts University and is a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also worked in a number of other capacities, including Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, the Department of Defense, the RAND Corporation, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He continues to advise offices within the U.S. intelligence community and the Department of Defense. Now, I read his book, Unrivaled, Why America Will Remain the World's Sole Superpower, when it came out a few years ago, and I've recommended it many times to friends and colleagues. His second book is on the U.S. and China and is co-written with Hal Brands. Welcome to the show, Michael Beckley. Chris, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And uh, can you correct me? Uh, have you written two books? Is that what it is? Two books. Yep, that's it. Thanks for uh, for the generous introduction, though. <laughs> you bet. Um, well, I, I felt like the, uh, the situation right now with uh, Ukraine is kind of just being portrayed as this border situation um, and uh, and the U.S. is trying to figure out how to respond to it, as are other countries. But there's this other story, which is the balance of power uh, that you talk about in your book. So I wanted to start off by talking about the thesis of your book so listeners can get a sense of your perspective on U.S. power in the world. Can you give, give us kind of a synopsis of that? Sure. I mean, the argument, as you can imply from the title, is that the United States will remain head and shoulders in terms of wealth and military power above other countries. That doesn't mean other countries like China, Russia, North Korea, Iran aren't threats. In fact, ironically, uh, the peaking of some of those powers, I think, actually explains some of their aggressive behavior and why they actually are becoming more of a threat in the short term. But in terms of just overall raw power, we're living in an age where you have one country that's far ahead of others. And that leads to just a number of unique features of the international system. It also means the United States has certain opportunities for its foreign policy, but is also going to confront a number of uh, areas of blowback just simply by being so much more powerful. So the point of that, uh, the first book was really to make the case for why the United States had this big lead, why I think the lead will um, will will go you know into, into the foreseeable future, but then what that means for U.S. foreign policy and for international security more generally. So there's so much discussion, at least in my classes, and I'm sure you come across this as well, about the fear that people have in the United States of a country like Russia or of China. Can you talk about kind of how, um, you know, what are, where, to what extent should we be concerned about their power in terms of rivalry with the United States? Well, we should obviously be extremely concerned about their, their power and the way that they can be threatening, not just from a military perspective, but also by reworking parts of the, <clears throat> of the global economy and also spreading authoritarianism abroad. The point of the book was just to say, look, the, the, the threat is not so much that China or Russia overtakes the United States as a superpower, but more that these countries will lash out in their region or try to do things asymmetrically to offset American power. And those can be even more destabilizing in some ways, but it's not the threat of this long-term overtaking by one country over another. I think that's a really important distinction that I was able to solidify in my mind by reading your book, because um, we kind of think in, in terms of like these monoliths, you know, that uh, that they are a threat to us, but they have these other geographical interests that are closer to them um, in both the case of China and Russia. Can you talk about them? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously in China's case, I think before it become a major global power, it needs to become the dominant power in East Asia. And there's a number of barriers preventing it from doing that. And so obviously the Taiwan situation is completely intolerable for the CCP. And that's why I worry very much about a Chinese move against Taiwan sometime this decade. At the same time, China confronts a world where it's still very reliant 
on Western technology. We're seeing that, especially in the case of semiconductors, and also doesn't want wants to change that because you know it's 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 a huge security risk and also puts Chinese firms at a disadvantage. And so now we're seeing with its dual circulation policy this attempt to increase self reliance, and then at the same time, China and Russia as authoritarian powers naturally want there to be more autocracies in the world because those autocracies won't criticize them for their human rights abuses. And also, if, if democracies look chaotic and shambolic, that's even better because then the Chinese and the Russian people won't want to emulate those democratic systems um, and potentially demand more political and, and civil rights. So, you know, I, the, the whole point is to say, look, these, these are the problems that these countries face precisely because they are weaker than the United States. They are much more threatened than I think people in the United States fully appreciate by something like NATO expansion or something like the US military presence in East Asia or democracy promotion or the spread of a, a trade agreement, say, between the EU and Ukraine. These things which we think of as almost innocuous or as actually providing international stability are really viewed in Moscow and Beijing as mortal threats. And so just I think we need to come to grips with that. And so getting into the kind of, uh, for me, I'm as a historian, I'm thinking in terms of like this Sino-Soviet split, I'm kind of stuck in the back and in, in the dark ages, so to speak, right? And this has changed in recent years, right? It used to be that Russia and China were kind of enemies with each other. And we, we exploited that with Nixon's opening uh, China. But uh, how did, when did things start to change? And how have they changed? Well, I would still look to your historical expertise, because I think that the Sino-Soviet split still has uh, some resonance even today. So even though it, obviously you have Putin and Xi meeting, people are talking about a bromance between them and as well as a larger sort of condominium between Russia and China, I still view those two countries more as accomplices rather than as full-fledged allies. I don't think either country is prepared to sacrifice significant blood and treasure simply to defend the other. Uh, you know, they may cooperate in areas of common interest. They may kind of cheer each other on from the sidelines as China was doing with Russia um, as, as it started to mass forces around Ukraine. But as we've seen just recently with China sort of stepping back and saying, well, maybe we need a diplomatic resolution to this conflict because they're afraid of blowback. I don't think either side is ready to go the full tilt and really start sacrificing for each other in the same way that, say, the United States would if a NATO country were directly attacked or if Japan, say, were attacked by China. And so I think we need to look at them more as a, more of a marriage of convenience. Now, granted, they have some key interests uh, in line, namely opposing the United States and the expansion of Western democratic influence, but that doesn't necessarily make them allies. And so, you know, the fact that these two countries were allies in the 1950s, then broke up in the 1960s, and by 1969, were fighting a war with each other, I think just shows you that when you have two powerful countries right next to each other, there may be some inherent limits to which they can put their differences aside, fully trust each other, and actively sacrifice blood and treasure for each other. How much of a connection, like what kinds of connections, economic, political, military, do, do China and, this, and Russia have to this day? Well, the trade volumes are actually remarkably low. Um, the, the key source, obviously, is energy, because China is a massive energy consumer. The um, and try, and Russia obviously has a lot of oil and natural gas. And so that, you know, I think is a very durable economic partnership. Other elements of the relationship are on slightly shakier ground. So it used to be that Russia sold China a lot of arms and technology, but I think the Russians have been um, displeased with the fact that China has reverse engineered a lot of those systems and is now not only making it, making their own military technology, but selling military hardware around the world, including to some of Russia's former client states. So it was actually becoming a competitor in, in, in arms markets. Um, and Russia, meanwhile, is selling arms to some of China's rivals like India and Vietnam. So China doesn't like that. Um, they obviously both have a, a key interest in, in pushing back on, on democracy, as I mentioned before. And I think they both want to see um, you know, their ability to push, expand their peripheries in ways that come at the expense of the United States and its allies. But beyond that, you know, they, they have their own specific interests. And there are certain areas of the world where they're actually sort of rivals, like in Central Asia, both countries view that region 
as part of their natural sphere of influence. And while Putin and Xi have said that they will uh, that they will you know cooperate and actually try to merge the Eurasian Economic Union, that's Russia's program, with China's Belt and Road. For, to me, I think that's there's going to be limits to that. They're inevitably going to compete over who is kind of the, the 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 core of that new regional economy. Who gets to gets first dibs on the resources of that region? Who gets to negotiate the trade agreements? So to me, there, there's just natural areas of rivalry there. Interesting. Uh, so much to think about here. I mean, each of the the statements that you're making, each sentence is like several books worth of information. <laughs> you know, touch, touched on the Vietnam issue and and on India, and the rivalry with uh, uh, with uh, with China. Of course, all of that is so important. Um, and it reminds me too the first time I, I made friends uh, with some local people from Tamil Nadu, India. Uh, they were making the point that uh, that just as important for their uh, for their neighborhood is their uh, animosity with China because of some of the uh, there's some border regions that uh, that both countries claim right right and yeah I mean and these are large these are large pieces of territory I mean the areas that either China controls but India claims or that India controls and China claims are the size of European you know Western European some Western European countries so these are huge chunks of territory and we saw um, just recently you know just over a year ago that the two sides actually came to blows, albeit not with firearms, but you know, Indian and Chinese soldiers were beating each other to death up in the Himalayas over what, you know, to an outside observer may look like useless territory. I mean, we're talking about the, some of the most mountainous terrain on earth, but to both countries, these are important strategic buffers for China. It's parts that border, you know, uh, Xinjiang and Tibet, um, you know, which obviously are very sensitive regions. And so it's natural that these two countries are going to have this rivalry. And I think the fact that they came to blows has actually uh, heightened uh, Chinese uh, Indian competition across the board. So now you see India playing a bigger role in the maritime domain, getting more active with the Quad, cooperating more with Australia, with the United States, with Japan to try to provide regional maritime security. And, you know, the United States hopes to actually build a stronger economic partnership with India to reduce some of its reliance on China. Maybe that could be in the works further down the line. But it shows that, you know, when China gets into one dispute in one particular area with its neighbors, it tends to have knock on effects just because China's in such a rough neighborhood and has this uniquely, well, China and Russia, I would say, have these uniquely complex geostrategic positions that I, I, it must be a nightmare for people that are involved in making foreign policy for either country to deal with. And that's what I was thinking about in your book too, because you're, you're pointing out how in, in, in uh, the case of China, it's surrounded by enemies uh, for the most part, right? Or people at least that they can't necessarily count on. So a lot of their defense has to go into kind of defending those borders. Unlike with the United States, we're kind of like in a Goldilocks zone where we don't really have to worry about, you know, we're not threatened by any of our neighbors. Um, and, and I'm wondering how is this uh, kind of, how we're talking about Russia because they just invaded uh, Ukraine and we're not sure where that's going to go. What are some of the kind of uh, strategic and geographic considerations that Russia has to consider? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it makes sense why Russia is going into Ukraine from a geographic perspective, because, you know, Ukraine is this vast, flat piece of territory that has basically been a highway for invaders into Russia, whether it's Napoleon, uh, you know, Imperial Germany, Nazi Germany have kind of poured across these borderlands between uh, Central Europe and Russia. And so Russia wants to extend just for purely geostrategic purposes, wants to extend its periphery to include big parts of Ukraine, as well as ultimately parts of Poland, as well as the Baltic countries, because then it would have much more defensible borders. You could extend them all the way to, say, the Carpathian Mountains so that you don't have this vast tract of land. You also have the fact that a lot of you know Russia's gas exports go through pipelines that go directly under Ukraine. The fact that Ukraine, obviously, with Crimea, has this big uh, port you know on the Black Sea and is Russia's main access, its warm water port access that ultimately goes out to uh, to the Mediterranean. Um, you know, there's just important geo geographic factors there. Um, I, I actually think there's also some economic factors as well. I actually think some of the instability we're seeing today was kickstarted by a, a huge slowdown in the Russian economy that occurred now, you know, a, a decade ago when the oil prices went down and Russia started putting pressure on Ukraine and other former Soviet states to join this Eurasian Economic Union. Basically, Russia wanted to have its version of NAFTA, essentially, where it can use the, these neighboring states as sources of cheap labor, as markets to sell its goods, um, basically ways to boost 
the Russian economy through ex, uh, external expansion. Ukraine, uh, at least part of Ukraine, many Ukrainians were not so interested in that and they wanted to go with the EU. And I think that's what ultimately catalyzed the crisis in 2014. And, we're, and now we're seeing the next and, and much more intense phase of that standoff. Um, and so now Russia is using military options instead. So, you know, there's economic factors here, there's geographic factors here. And then I think, you know, the national pride and just the humiliation that uh, Vladimir Putin and other uh, leaders in Russia felt by the dissolution of the Soviet Union and by the expansion of NATO to their doorstep. You know, these are all important factors that I think now, it you know, people are, are much more aware of, but going into the crisis, maybe, um, you know, the average a uh, citizen who's just going about their day is not so um, aware of all these sort of grievances that Russia has. Wow. The, the economic factor is uh, obviously very important in a lot of countries in the past, too, in the way they've made decisions about how to proceed forward, especially when they annex other countries. I'm thinking uh, first about Iraq. When they went into Kuwait, they were they have been devastated by the cost of the Iran-Iraq war, and they felt like Kuwait was uh, undercutting them, taking their oil from them, but also the price of oil had gone down, so Iraq became more poor, which helped to explain why they might threaten uh, their neighbors. Uh, and you also mentioned the um, the fact that this kind of goes back to 2014. Can you talk about this this uh, the roots of this current crisis as it goes back to that that initial uh, conflict that we were watching in the Crimea? Yeah, I'll take you back even a little bit further to the 2000s. So when Russia's economy is booming because oil prices are going up and Putin's popularity basically rises in tandem with the rate of economic growth. But then around you know 2008, 2009, you have uh, a big drop partially because of the 2008 financial crisis, which craters global demand for a while, as well as just changes in oil and gas markets. And so Russia's Russia starts hemorrhaging um, uh, money. And Putin, you know, starts turning to more coercive measures. Now, there's obviously the operation in Georgia, but I think in addition, the Russians come up with this idea of creating this Eurasian economic union, sort of a, an economic empire that's centered around Moscow and starts pressuring its neighbors. And Ukraine, because it has the biggest population, it's it's one of the, you know the wealthiest countries in that region, um, is obviously a, a key target for the Kremlin. And so they really start putting pressure on the Ukrainian government to join with Moscow. And they try to, in, you know, they obviously influence internal Ukrainian politics to get their own sort of pro-Russia candidates into high office. And, but the problem is a big chunk of Ukrainians would rather go with the West. You know, they would rather have a big comprehensive trade agreement with the EU. And so that's what ultimately leads to 2014, where you have the Russian, the, the sort of pro-Russia president of Ukraine at the time, you know, sort of trying to waffle between the two um, and, and ultimately trying to side with the Russians and Ukrainians just being livid about this and ultimately protesting um, and leading to an overthrow of that government and installation of a new government that's more oriented towards the EU. And so then, you know, Putin says, OK, well, if we're not going to use economic measures, we have other ways to bring Ukraine back into the fold. And so they, you know, launched the operation with in Crimea. Um, and, and now I think this is sort of the next level of that. And do you think that, uh, that Putin is actually targeting the whole of Ukraine in this venture? It, it actually looks like that could well be the case now, just given the, I mean, so we're talking about this, like the morning that these attacks have, have started, but um, you know, the fact that they're, they're coming at Ukraine from three different sides, the fact that they're, are uh, airstrikes going on in, in major cities suggests at least an attempt to destabilize the Ukrainian government and to wipe out Ukraine's military power so that even if you may not have uh, you know, Russian troops sort of stationed in large numbers in Kyiv, that it basically has forced uh, Ukraine into a completely prone position where it has to do Russia's bidding and it's effectively taken over and lost its sovereignty. So I think that's at least possible. I mean, the other possibility is that th this is a way to bog down and, and take out Ukraine's offensive power, which then makes it easier for Russia to consolidate its control in eastern Ukraine. But as of as of right now, um, and this is developing very quickly, it looks like this could be a full scale attack on Ukraine. And does Russia have the, in your opinion, at least, or in your uh, uh, analysis, uh, or if you, I don't know if you thought about this or not, do you think that Russia actually has the capacity to support a military an ongoing military uh, venture like this because I mean it takes lots of you know resources water food lubricants petroleum 
um, morale, all of that, do you think that they have the capacity to, to take on something like this that would go potentially for months or years? Yeah, it's hard for me to see Russia being able to quell all semblance of resistance from Ukraine. So you could expect some kind of insurgency that persists so that even if Russia is ultimately able to call a lot more of the shots in Ukraine and has consolidated some semblance of political control, it's still going to be it's going to be a war zone, you know, for the foreseeable future. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm not so confident in the Ukrainians ability to sustain an, an insurgency indefinitely or, or throw Russia out simply because um, you know, you need safe havens to have an effective insurgency, and it's not clear to me that you, Ukraine will will necessarily have that uh, across borders. Uh, you also, you know, just just the daily realities of, of having to be an insurgent that is a really really tough ask, and the fact that Russia has modernized its military so much, especially over the last five years, and can just pound Ukrainian forces with um, in, intense artillery fire and will basically control the skies will make it very hard for any type of strong Ukrainian forces to to stand up. And so at best, you might get sort of sporadic insurgent conflict that may last for a long time, but won't necessarily, you know, prevent Russia from consolidating effective control over Ukraine. What kinds of uh, demographic challenges might Russia have right now that would um, maybe incentivize it or, or play a role in this? I mean, yeah, so I think this is sort of part and parcel of, of the narrative we talked about before, where I think, you know, Putin is looking at the long term trends, both economically and, and very much related to that demographically, the fact that Russia's population is shrinking rapidly after, you know, decades of uh, you had, you know, uh, just because of the chaos that was going on in Russia, you know, it depresses the birth rate, you also had extremely high levels of um, disease as well as alcoholism, drug abuse, um, homicide because of organized crime taking over big parts of the country. And so as a result, the Russian population is a shell of its former self and is, is, is shrinking, it's declining. I mean, this is part of why Obama um, you know, years ago said Russia is effectively a declining power, at least in demographic terms, that is indeed the case. And so I think that also affects the timeline. I think that helps explain some of the timing of what we're seeing today where Putin may feel this is kind of the last opportunity to really take drastic action to reverse Russia's sort of steady decline um, as, as a major power. It needs to, if it's gonna make big moves now, it still can um, and, and still is reaping some of the benefits that it had of those years of rapid growth in the 2000s, but it's kind of past its peak. And so now it needs to take more drastic actions to continue to amass wealth and power and conquest you know, we used to think that conquest had kind of gone out of style, but conquest is still a way to do that. And I, I'm sure that factors into his calculus. And what, what's the uh, demographics of Ukraine like? Uh, how much of a, the population is Russian and, and how much of, of the Russian population that's there is actually interested in being part of Russia? That, you know, that's actually really hard to say. And this is where I'll defer to um, specialists in, in the area. I'm not a Russia specialist, but, you know, I, I think there's an important distinction that my colleague at uh, AEI Chris Miller has made, which is like, look, just because someone is a Russian speaker doesn't necessarily mean that they're part, they want to be part of Russia, let alone that they consider themselves ethnically Russian or solely ethnically Russian, as opposed to also part Ukrainian. So I think it's, it becomes very slippery. And I, as a non-specialist, I hesitate to make any kind of solid um, statistical breakdowns of who exactly is Russian and who wants to be part of Russia. My, my sense, and this is based on, largely on the research of Chris Miller, who's, you know, he's both a professor at Tufts along with me as well as at AI. He, he is, uh, you know, cited statistics showing that the, the level of anti-Russian sentiment across Ukraine, even in Eastern Ukraine, really went up in the years after 2014, because you just had this long grinding war in Eastern Ukraine that turned even some, you know, many Russian speakers against the Kremlin. I, you know, who, I, I don't know what the final breakdown is ultimately though. Clearly there's some, there's, there's a fair amount of support for Russia in, in certain parts of Eastern Ukraine. That's a, a great point to bring up, I think, because we think in the United States, for example, we have a large Mexican American population or even people Mexican born who live on the border, but they're not necessarily gonna be in favor of Mexican national interests over US interests. And so just being from that national background or speaking the language or having the culture isn't uh, going to equate with an affiliation with the uh, with the same uh, nation. Um, there's, there's a lot of things we could talk about. I know we don't have too much time. Um, some of the other things I was wondering about is uh, what exactly is the 
uh, like, could you say some more about the how we should consider China's role in all this? Like, what kind of uh, things are going to be affected uh, in China uh, by this invasion? Well, I think, you know, China, on the one hand, certainly likes to see the United States and its allies bogged down and anything that draws their attention away from East Asia is all to the good for China. But I think the Chinese are also worried that not only will Russia's actions disrupt the global economy, um, which could hurt China, which is enmeshed in, in all parts of the global economy, but also actually trigger anti-Chinese actions because you know the Biden administration, and this is sort of a holdover, has, has argued that this isn't just a, a US-China competition or US-Russia competition. He said at his very first press conference after taking office, that he views these competitions as part of a larger struggle between democracy and autocracy. That he said uh, historians one day will be writing their, their PhD dissertations on who won this contest and why. And I, I think there's there's a lot of truth behind this in the sense that he says we have to prove that democracy works, you know, and that autocracy is not the wave of the future. And we've assumed for so long that democracy would just spread because it's so obviously the right way to run a country. But that has very much come into question. And a lot of people are becoming less enamored and less supportive of democracy. And so now when Russia or China make inroads, it's not just a win for them. It's also sort of a win for this um, broader ideological struggle. And so I think the Chinese are seeing what's going on in the United States. They already see the very high levels of anti-China sentiment. They realize that, you know, the photo ops between Xi and, and Putin really help solidify in the minds of Americans and others in the West that there is this like Russia-China alliance going on and that these two authoritarian powers are on the march. And so I think the Chinese are actually worried they're going to catch a fair amount of blowback. And in fact, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said a couple of weeks ago that China will bear some of the costs, I think were his words, if Russia ultimately invades Ukraine, which it now has. And so you could see, you know, a lot of the same kind of sanctions, the same kind of economic restrictions being placed on Russia starting to spill over into U.S. relations with China, which already are headed in the direction of more walls and more economic decoupling. I think the Chinese very much worry that this could um, spill over there. Um, uh, you know, some people, I, there's also this argument that, well, this may give China an opportunity to move on Taiwan, which is certainly possible. And so maybe from a military perspective, China may benefit from the conflict that's going on. I'm a little bit skeptical of that just because I think China has its own timeline for Taiwan. I think it's probably later this, this decade for a number of reasons. And Xi Jinping going into this coming October has this big leadership, you know, party Congress where he's going to be exceeding his unofficial term limits, you know, for the first time. Everyone knows he's going to do this, but the fact that this is where it's actually going to happen, I think has caused him to want to keep China more locked down and quiet and not start major international conflicts right now when he's focused on solidifying his domestic base and certainly the economy. You know, the Chinese government's trying to prop up their economy and don't want global instability to put even more pressure on the, the Chinese uh, growth model right now. So I think China's worried from just sort of an economic instability perspective, as well as the fact that anti-Russian sentiment can easily bleed over into anti-Chinese sentiment and cause for more harsh responses towards China as well as Russia. Wow. Um, this is just bringing to mind a lot of different questions. One of the questions is, can you, uh, what kinds of, do you know what kinds of sanctions we're actually imposing right now on Russia because of the invasion? There, yeah. So the the general categories are, you know, they're trying to uh, basically cut Russia's ability to uh, use the international banking system, which will make it hard for it to engage in international trade. And because the United so much, uh, so many international financial transactions are conducted in dollars, gives the United States a unique ability to do this. At the same time, you know, the EU is threatening massive sanctions, and Germany has already said Nord Stream two, you know, this big gas pipeline that was supposed to bring even more natural gas from Russia to Germany and would have been a huge financial windfall for the Russian regime is, is basically frozen um, and, and is probably a, a dead letter at this point. So I think it's a combination of trying to reduce economic reliance on Russia, especially obviously energy imports. And the US is trying to backstop that by sending more natural gas to European nations to basically uh, substitute for, for Russian gas. So that combined with these financial sanctions, not just on Russian companies, but on specific Russian uh, oligarchs and leaders to really target those at the top, Putin's relatively small inner circle of powerful oligarchs, and just hope that that kind of pressure imposes personal costs on them and may cause political discontent that threatens Putin's own hold on power. I think they're hoping that that kind of bite 
will dissuade uh, Putin from escalating further, will hopefully compel him to pull back. I'm, I'm skeptical that that will actually happen, but it at least is a way to impose costs on um, Putin and his, his regime. And, and of course, sanctions are, play a role basically in kind of ratcheting up things without having to use force. Is there a threshold, do you think, that the U.S. will, uh, that will be met before the United States, uh, that could, the United States could actually engage in military um, action in this theater? You know, that's, that's, such, that's such an important question, and it's really hard to say, because on the one hand, I think, you know, most Americans don't want to fight and die for Ukraine. You know, most of them couldn't point to it on a map, and I don't say that disparagingly. I mean, why, you know, it's, such, it's so far away, it's not a NATO member, and so for all these reasons, you could see sort of a lack of support for escalating to a potential great power war over Ukraine, and clearly Russia cares a lot more about Ukraine than the United States does. On the other hand, if Russia just starts massacring people in Ukrainian cities and you have large scale combat, I don't know, maybe that changes the situation. It puts more pressure on the regime. It ignites a lot more anti-Russian sentiment. Things can change very rapidly in wars. I mean, what we've seen time and again is that wars are easy to start. They're extremely hard to end and they tend to escalate and get really messy and spread geographically as well as um, in terms of the domains in which they're being fought. And so who knows where, where this could end. I think the most likely would be still a limited war where the United States is trying to funnel arms and support to the Ukrainians, but is not directly involved. But who knows? I think obviously the major threshold would be an attack uh, on a NATO member. And that's why you know, NATO is obviously strengthening its, its eastern flank. Gosh, yeah, this is uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, uh, to to close up, I wanted to ask uh, if you could talk to us about your new uh, China U.S. book. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I've worked with uh, the historian Hal Brands on on a book um, called Danger Zone: The Coming Crisis with China, and you know, obviously, Russia is going to be very much in the headlines going forward, and Russia has kind of put us in a new world. But we think that this is part of a broader pattern, namely that. Um, the most dangerous kind of great power is what we call a peaking power, those that were rising like gangbusters for a while, but then because either their economy starts to slow or they start to get encircled by rivals or some horrible combination of both of those things tend to become much more prickly and aggressive. They crack down at home and they expand abroad. We think, and as, I, as we, you and I discussed, Chris, earlier, I actually think that, in, that story in part explains the Russia-Ukraine conflict and how it's escalated, that it really comes after Putin comes under enormous pressure economically and in terms of his political hold, and he starts becoming much more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and that has escalated up till the present day. We worry that China is going to go through a similar dynamic sometime this decade, because in the book, we go through all of the problems in China's economy. China's economy is in a much worse position than most people think. And at the same time, anti-China sentiment around the world has surged to levels we haven't seen since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, and it's starting to manifest itself in strategic encirclement for China. You, you just look around China's periphery, and it seems like every country, whether it's India, Australia, Japan, the Taiwanese, even the South Koreans. I mean, in South Korea, China is now more hated than Japan, which is remarkable given the amount of anti-Japanese sentiment because of the historical legacy between Japan and South Korea. So some of this is COVID, but it's also a reaction to China's aggressive and repressive behavior over the last decade. And so we worry that Xi Jinping is looking at, you know, a slowing economy, a, a soon to be shrinking population, massive debt, strategic encirclement, and is now looking for ways to expand not only to boost China's economy, but also to accomplish national aims before it's too late. And we've seen this happen time and time again. The most extreme examples are, say, uh, Imperial Germany before World War I, which was worried about the rise of Russia and France, and so launched World War I to try to beat back its rivals before it was too late. And then Imperial Japan, prior to World War II, you know, was worried that its empire was basically being choked out by the United States, that its economy was slowing, so it had to make major moves while it still could. And there's many other examples too. And we actually think that Russia today is, is another example. So we worry that China is going through this peaking power trap, that it's going to become even more aggressive as its power peaks. And that's that means that the US-China competition is not this long-term marathon where we can take decades, kind of get our own house in order, invest in long-term innovation. We actually view the sharpest phase of that competition as a 10-year sprint, essentially, in the 2020s, that there's going to be severe military crises, an economic showdown um, between these two countries, precisely because China is going to try to make moves in the short term um, before it's too late. 
Wow. I, I, I really appreciate you uh, laying all this out for us. And, and I would encourage our listeners to check out uh, either one of your books is uh, Danger Close. That's what it, I'm sorry. Uh, Danger Zone, The Danger Coming Zone, Conflict right. with China. And it will be out in uh, August of this year. Okay, so that's coming out in August. And uh, Unrivaled is available right now on Audible and on Amazon, too. And if anybody wants to uh, to read your um, updated interviews and articles, things like that, where can they go? Uh, just I have, I have a website where I try to post as many of my articles and interviews um, for free. Um, and it's just michaelbeckley.org. If you just Google my name, Michael Beckley, it should uh, be one of the first things that comes up. And then you can access, um, you know, I try to get paywalls waived, et cetera, so that people that are interested can, can just get the materials for free. Great. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Michael Beckley, for talking to us today. Where are we talking to you right now? Uh, I'm in the New York area, just outside of New York. So I'm between my, my two jobs, one in Boston and one in DC. So. Great. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our audience today and, uh, and hope that uh, things kind of simmer down uh, sooner rather than later. I hope so and, too. Uh, Thanks so much for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Take care. Bye.